Are we live, honey? Okay, it looks like it works. <laughs> so we should be on live now. Yay. Um, I'm so thrilled for this. And Ron, I think your mic is off. So I was gonna, perfect. There you are. So um, welcome everybody. I um, am so thrilled to be here with author Ron Austin. And we're both tuning in from Missouri which is kind of exciting. <laughs> so we're all in the same time zone this time, which is kind of neat. Um, so we, to kind of start quickly, we are going live in two different spaces. So we have a Zoom webinar. So if that's more comfortable for you, those of you who are in the Zoom webinar, hello. Um, I encourage you if you're in the Zoom webinar to type in questions into the Q&A. If you just go to the bottom of your screen, you can click on the Q&A section there and just submit questions. Only I see those. So I'll just kind of be asking wrong questions as those come in. And then to those of you on Facebook, hi, welcome. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to just comment as the broadcast is going on. And um, Coop is monitoring those and we'll pass those along to me. And I'll of course pass those along to Ron. So um, to begin, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Jen Mervin, and I am uh, the owner of Pagination Bookshop here in Springfield, Missouri. And I'm also a professor at Missouri State University here in Springfield. And I am absolutely thrilled to have Ron. We actually had him come visit campus and speak last semester. Um, so, you know, some of you who are tuning in might have been able to attend that reading. Um, I met Ron, gosh, when was that? Like two years ago, maybe three years ago? Yeah, in St. Louis at um, uh, St. Louis Community College at, at a writing conference. And I just, I loved your reading. I thought it was amazing. Um, that was such a fun event. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I just, reading your book, and I've been spending a lot of time with it yesterday and today to preparing for our interview. So I feel like I'm just in the world of your book and it's, <laughs> it's hard to tune out and like do life later today. Um, so I'm really excited to, to ask you some questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and give your formal introduction here. Um, so kind of to begin and then, and then I'll hand it over to Ron to, blow us all away with his reading. Um, okay, so here is the official bio. Um, Ron Austin's short stories have appeared in Pleiades, Story Quarterly, Ninth Letter, Black Warrior Review, and many other journals. Um, his book, Avery Colt is a Snake, a Thief, a Liar, uh, won the 2017 Nilsson Prize and was long listed for the Penn uh, Bingham Prize, which is you know, sort of the holy grail of literary prizes. So that's amazing. And uh, one thing I do want to talk to Ron about is um, some other parts of his bio. So Ron is also has a big passion for comics and has adapted one of the short stories in his book into a, a short form comic, like a chat book comic. Um, so he's going to talk about that. And um, and he's also a, a longtime creative writing professor. So we were actually kind of talking about our teaching a little bit before we started. So Ron, I am going to uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. All right, perfect. Um, thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Um, so this is a great Thursday night. Hopefully you'll have a good time with us. I'll read some things and we'll talk and uh, it'll be wonderful. And Mainly, I just right. want to say thanks a lot for um, picking up the book and putting on this event. And uh, I'll I'll kind of cut off my rambling now and jump in. Oh, you're things. perfect. <laughs> Great. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to start off by reading uh, my latest story. Uh, this is a story that I finished recently that I feel pretty happy with. Um, the 
style and the tone is a little bit different than Avery Cult, but it's in a lot of ways it's very similar. But I'm going to go ahead and read part of a newer story, and then I'm going to read a story from Avery Cult is a Snake, a Thief, a Liar. But to get started, I'm going to read Brand New Plagues for Everybody. A mean hex mutated every sorry scrap of junk inside Three Kings pawn shop. Merchandise took on nasty animalistic aspects. Nothing could be salvaged, best believe me. I'm saying slimy water hoses slithered and shed snake skin. Microphone screw burly gorilla fur. Cordless power drills bucked warthog tusks. Tangled beef guts exploded from microwaves like spring-loaded confetti. Leaf blowers with thick elephant trunks. Braided gold chains flexed tough bodybuilder veins. The sound of old folks coughing crackled from flim-spitting bass speakers. Blood and snot splattered clean display cases. Bee stink headbutted my nose. I peeped that repugnant mess and bugged out. I'd been a grunt slash bodyguard and more at Three Kings for forever. A ruined pawn shop would ruin me and I couldn't afford to change lanes and start over. I prayed for forgiveness and chain smoked three cigarettes back to back to back. But Effie, the high and mighty Miss Boss Lady, she didn't trip. Since Miss Boss Lady was the new owner of Three Kings, she had to prove herself competent. She couldn't flinch at high powered hood shit, fist fights, attempted robberies, or crooked ass cops. It looked like she wouldn't let supernatural assaults break her back either. Bargain bin black magic could be copped at any corner store in this time of signs and wonders. Canned sacrificial lamb extra strength antifungal atonement ointment and everlasting sardines and set next to snacks and aspirin. Any chump could cast a brutal spell quicker than popping popcorn, smack enemies with festering boils. Though this shit was brand new. Salty poltergeist swaggered inside big screen TVs. Designer purses pursed unrepentant lips Brain matter clouded cubic zirconia. Antique revolver sneezed gunpowder. Disgruntled chainsaws growled threats. Shells rattled and Effie didn't say boo. She didn't stumble, didn't sweat out her finger waves, didn't drop her clipboard, didn't bust one wrinkle in her frumpy armor plated blazer. She kept right on taking inventory with that tired look on her face, as if it was any other Saturday morning, as if beetle wing brooches weren't circling her head. I couldn't believe that front and ass phony baloney act. To tell the whole truth, I never liked Effie from the jump. I tried advising Miss Wannabe after she inherited three kings from Uncle Zeke. Lord rest his trifling, rotten, greedy soul. The man would have snatched his own grandmama's wig, braided it, dyed it, and sold it right back to her. As she was the niece of the man who had employed me for years, I felt obliged to show her the basics, hip her to that good game. I told her to think about extension and real money moves, flipping out payday loans and classic cars. She hit me back with every buzzword she learned from earning a degree in nonprofit management. Ungrateful as could be, she rattled off nonsense about social equity and ethical businesses. Next, she told me possibly the third dumbest thing I have ever heard in my life. She told me she didn't want more profit. She wanted to turn Three Kings into a secondhand shop slash low-key charity, decked out with a canned good drive, debt forgiveness, and educational seminars on economics and building generational wealth. Now I didn't get disrespectful. I didn't talk all over her head, but I did keep it real. I told her what Zeke told me, nobody likes pawnbrokers. This is the business of the quick and the dead. Pawnbrokers cut stake from misfortune, 
crunch pennies out of family heirlooms and no amount of goodwill can spark cold furnaces, bend prison bars, restart dead engines, cast out cancer or replace the dollar almighty, amen. I offered to hash out our differing life philosophies over a bottle of Paul Masson at Empire Lounge, but she wouldn't listen to what I had to say. She told me fraternization between management and employees would be untenable at best. Then she put that extra little funk on it, talked about organizational restructuring and had the nerve to make it sound like I was lucky to keep my goddamn job. Effie didn't respect me and I couldn't blame her. She didn't know how I came up off the muscle. She didn't know me back from when I used to rock rat eating t-shirts and socks, back when I used to mow lawns for nothing but a damn can of frank and beans, back when I scraped change out of the gutter, back when I used to chew cuticles bloody, back when roaches squatted in my sneakers, back when I had to teach myself the oldest, truest magic, how to turn something out of nothing, pull a dollar out of 15 cents on oh God. It's easy for folks to mistake a career pawn shop grump as shiftless, as a man who turns whatever he touches into trash. It's easy to be overlooked. And I thought about making her see me. I thought about quitting in a rage, cussing her out, spitting on her polished shoes. But I bit my tongue and let it be. I know the smart man has got to go along to get along, even if it rips out his goddamn heart. And um, that is the beginning of a, of a newer story. Uh, so a lot of really interesting things happen next. And then there's a really good middle and then there's a knockout ending and uh, everybody likes it. That's it. So <laughs> that, was the, that was the first section of something new. And now I'm going to read from uh, Avery Colt. And I'm going to read the beginning of the last story. So for this story, I want you guys to imagine that you read about 150 pages of really um, great prose. And there's all this characterization and uh, setting and all this good stuff that kept you reading. And this is the dynamic conclusion. So you're really invested now. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start reading. This one is, nobody promised milk and honey. Before the corner store failed, grandma used to sit out front and gut buckets of fresh catfish granddad had caught that morning. Those catfish flopped over each other, fins slapping, mouths gasping, gills slicing open into long red slits. She pulled a paring knife from her apron, set down newspaper and cleaned them right there on the curb. Sludge dripping guts glowed in the sun, a clutch of bruised rubies. Once she had the fish frying inside, she'd stand in the doorway and hawk lunch specials. She'd be hollering, come and get it, come and get it. Fresh big lip catfish straight out the muddy Mississippi. Hang a tooth on that cornmeal crust. Hot sauce and onions ain't never had a better friend. I said, come on y'all. Them pants is burning up, that grease is popping. Them catfish is jumping, boys, they jumping. Truth is, I wanted my first job to be at grandma and granddad's corner store so I could rattle open those iron gates at dawn, fire up that oil drum smoker and squint as coal snapped the chorus. I wanted to shave cloudy chunks of ice for snow cones Pickle hot peppers harvested from grandma's garden, roast chicken bones and gizzards for that good gravy. I wanted to sneak rings from the toy machine to young kids and hope aluminum hearts might ward off misfortune. I wanted to ride my bike and deliver platters of snoots, neck bones, and ham hocks. I wanted to holler lunch specials at day laborers, bless lottery tickets, and haggle over dusty cans of sweet yams with mean goat bearded women who knew how to stretch a dollar further than Laffy Taffy, for real. I'd smooth wrinkles out of sweat soaked dollars sourced from the heels of boots, the bottoms of bras, ignore that damp funk and praise working folks. At the end of each day, I'd douse the coals, rattle the iron gate closed, 
balance the books by dusk light. Grandma would peep over my shoulder while granddad scraped burnt bone out of the smoker. She'd laugh bitterly, pop one of those pathetic bills and tell me, Avery, boy, it's raggedy, but it's still money, ain't it? And that's it for now. Um, <clears throat> so imagine that it comes to a really great conclusion and thank you all for listening. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I love hearing, I love hearing you read. Um, and that like, to me, you mentioned uh, when you were, before you started reading from the book, like the characterization and the sense of place, which is so strong in the book. And um, as I told you before we started, my first question I was gonna ask was about how you approach character, because I mean, as everyone just heard, the characterization in this book is so, so amazing. Um, I, one of my favorite uh, descriptions of character is of uh, the character of granddad. And this, uh, I, I'll just read a little passage too. <laughs> but um, it's the, the first uh, section in Cut Open the Vein. Uh, granddad would wink and fill an empty refrigerator with milk, eggs, meat, and cheese, call plump catfish from muddy banks and hustle them into a hot fryer, fertilize tomato plants with his dandruff, turn solid coin out of crushed beer cans, squeeze water from stone, resurrect busted engines with a thump and growl, honored old covenants of earth, blood, and motor oil. He could sew a loose stitch into a suit and clothe the naked man, roll breadcrumbs into a loaf and fill empty stomachs, but only a fool would mistake his kindness for weakness. And it goes on. I mean, it's just so wonderful. Um, and, you know, I, I think about how, you know, we talk as teachers a lot about how to render character and how to introduce characters. And, you know, you have just this beautiful introduction and then it goes on. Um, he could and would beat the brakes off a motherfucker. I'd seen him do it enough. Beat a man with fists, feet, baseball bat, revolver butt, or frying pan. Crack skulls against countertops. Choke a man until air hissed out from ears and eyes. His body sanging like a sack of beans. He told me once, have one damn thing worth a shit in this world. And there'll be a bastard waiting around the corner, pipe in his hand, waiting to take it, wanting to take it from you. Folks will rob you and clown on you too. make a damn celebration out of it. Granddad could do all that. His bones could not. And I just love how it's all, it's just like a masterclass in characterization because you have this picture of him in your mind and you have an idea of who he is and what motivates him and what his core beliefs are. Um, I'm curious as to like your process of characters, how do characters appear to you? Do you really work on them and sit with them for a while? Um, I would love to hear about your process. I would say that for me, a lot of um, my setting and characterization, it almost happens organically the same way that a relationship could as far as you notice details about a person. You think of them maybe globally or figuratively, um, but they don't start to really talk to you until you start noticing their details and what their habits are, what do they generally like to do and what their worldview is. And so along those lines, um, with Avery Call, one technique that I used a lot is sort of uh, building up characters in a mythical or romantic fa fashion. Yeah. And so in that introduction and that story, it's the most pronounced as far as um, the myth uh, being very much there in the opening lines as he's, as granddad is able to do these impossible feats. Yeah. And then there, I wanted to, I always want to add complexity generally through some form of contrast or through some kind of uh, manipulation of time or even like mind state, mind state or mindset. Yeah. And so I wanted to get this kind of like conflicting picture of somebody who is capable of great kindness and compassion, but also capable of great violence. And um, that has kind of a worldview that incorporates a certain amount of necessary violence. And that it's almost like, you know, you might wonder if a person at the, in that position is trying to kind of balance the scales or, you know, if it's just a matter of um, circumstance and situation. And then from there, after we have kind of the mythical kindness 
and compassion. Um, and then, you know, the other side uh, that could also show some anger and some wrath. And then finally, especially for that story, I wanted to go into the sadness of like being close to somebody and seeing them larger than life and then seeing them minimized by death um, yeah. or by getting away. And there's also some complexity too in that as the grandfather, as granddad is described in these mythical proportions that there isn't any, there's no like, and sometimes I'll use judgment about characters or especially like if another character has a certain judgment and like, I kind of like the chorus effect too in yeah. character. If I can get like one character to share their viewpoint of what a character does and what they are and then another character to do it and it's a little bit different or conflicting. Um, but there I wanted to get, I wanted this to be kind of like really objective in a sense, like this is the capacities that this person has. And then I wanted the reader to be engaged, of course, because it's the opening, but I wanted them to see this person as larger than life. And like, really, like maybe you would start, if if you hadn't read any of the, of the other stories in the collection, you might be like, okay, so this is about, you know, we're gonna see the grandfather on the page, which you do, but, um, you know that you're not going to see him complete that he's not going to be able to live up to this level of mythology or that there's going to be something that like there's that tension between making somebody larger than life um and making them this kind of like version of themselves that maybe other people see or that you want to see versus the reality of that person which comes out in the way that they how they struggle and how they meet challenges um yeah. So um, and characterization, I really, I really love writing, building everything up from the sentence and line level. And um, I'm really big on working characters and I'm really big on working settings. I think like throughout my work, I haven't always like paid as much attention to settings, but they've naturally have kind of evolved. And so on yeah. the current project, I'm spending some more like intentional time doing more work with the settings. I will. I love, I mean, to me, like that section just ramps up. I mean, I don't know if it's quite the third act of the book, but where, you know, we have these and Avery is such a beautiful narrator because there's this, this gorgeous sense of observation and language. And then like any great narrator, especially in a, a book that's populated with such an interesting cast, he can kind of disappear, but I mean, we always are through his eyes, but you know, in moments like that, granddad takes the stage or when we, we see um, the grandmother, you know, bossing around the workers to try to get the, the empty lot turned into a garden. And she just, you know, steps out from the shadows and is this really larger than life character, you know, interacting with this other larger in life character, um, which is just so interesting. I am. Um... One thing I like about writing um, connected stories is I really, I really like the idea of, um, and like I do it on a, on a smaller level within a story itself, but I like the idea of like introducing like what almost seems like a stray character or stray element or stray detail. Yeah. And like, maybe you, you know, it could be a detail that appears in the text for like maybe a paragraph. And yeah. at that point, maybe it's just an interesting detail but then later on in a different story, like 50 pages later, it becomes like the uh, the main element that we're exploring and investigating. And right. per personally, if I'm like inter engaging with any kind of media and it does that, it has like an interesting, satisfying effect in the yes. sense it makes the world feel fuller. Yes. And so that's one thing I like. To, that is one technique I like to play with a lot. And I, I noticed that as a reader and so appreciated it. And I, I feel like Jasmine Ward does that so beautifully. She's one of, I mean, she does it so overtly where it's almost like you can time when she's going to bring a detail back and she'll echo it in a, such a surprising description. It'll be like, how did you, it blows my mind. I just love it. But yeah, I noticed that toward the end, especially with that. I like, it kind of becomes a refrain or a motif of this idea of like can't make a meal without a little blood on the floor mm -hmm. and it's a very literal blood you know in that story when it's brought up but then you echo that detail later 
when Avery's trying to make dinner to sort of like mend his <laughs> mother's relationship with his sister. And, you know, there's blood on the floor, but, you know, and he kind of recalls that line a little bit, but it's, it's turned and it's applied in a different way. And it's so satisfying. That narrative echo is so satisfying to read. And that's so fun as a writer too. When you land those moments, you're like, yes. I am. Um, I like how you're talking in it, about it in terms of like echoes and like sonically, um, because for me, I am. Um, I really enjoy music. Like music is one of those things where, like, I wish I could play an instrument, but I just like enjoy the way that music works and how it can affect your mood, and things like musical phrasing and movements, and even just something like um, a chorus, refrains, and then like how the structure of a song can turn a phrase on its head um yeah. and so with uh with Avery Colt I think that I was like um I, I think each project that you do it teaches you something I very much believe mm -hmm. that, that the energy you spend exploring and investigating and trying out different things you get a handle on certain things and you also kind of surprise yourself and so like um what was really nice about this project is that I knew that the project or the book was about finished when what I wanted to do started to really like, like a bristle at the edges of what I could do with this book itself. And Ooh. one of those things was like more so focusing on the musicality that's possible in the line and then yeah. pursuing that more intentionally, which I think I do that more so with my newer work. Mm. Well, I know I noticed that. I mean, it, it is so musical. One, I really love the building up of the phrases and the long sentences that feel it, the energy gets ramped up and then there's this kind of beautiful um, resonant close. And I just the, even the last lines of each story, I mean, even if I, I was just listening and I didn't know that there was white space underneath and it was the end, I think I would know. Cause it just, you know, how sometimes you just know that. I mean, it you just hear it and that's the close. So, so you, I was gonna ask you if you played a musical instrument actually, and if you were a musician. <laughs> I mean, I, so I've been trying to pick up the piano and then like, I think everybody have a guitar in my corner that I'm just like, yeah. Someday when I have all that free time. Right. Um, <laughs> but I um I listen to a lot of R and B and hip hop and I'm like obsessed with production and just like the concepts behind that and then also the structures behind because like if you listen to just any like really um proficient, efficient um like hip hop artists or R and B artists, they have to say so much in a limited amount of time. Yeah. And so like some of my favorite songs are like songs that are like two minutes, but you have this whole story and this whole world that you've been pulled into for two minutes. And it feels like that two minutes was actually 10 or 15 minutes. And so yeah. I, I kind of like to play with that compression and expression expansion on the line level. And yeah. it's kind of, I feel, I feel kind of accomplished if I'm able to like efficiently build in a lot of details and a lot of texture and make something really really lush in the span of um a page or two pages yeah well and if i mean to me i loved link story collections i just think they're so unique and they're you know i think it's tricky like just on the cover you know it's like do you put a linked collection or do you say stories or do you say a novel you know i mean it's it's tricky but I almost think about it as like an album because it's it's cohesive, but it gives you that freedom in each section to kind of, you can pause and kind of tell this story over here, but it's all linked together. I mean, it feels very musical just in structure, a linked story collection. That's, um. so that's where I had to, I used um, the structure of a concept album to actually organize the story collection itself. Oh, awesome. And, it's um because this is like this book is like the culmination of uh just what I had been working on for years and it was kind of like I mean it's 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 fun and exciting when I think at the point where it's like maybe two-thirds done I was like oh this is all coming together it's working out and I was like how do I write 
a last story that sums up everything that happened previously, but is also still its own story. What does it need right. to do? What kind of story story does it need to be? Right. Um, and so I, I spent a lot of time just listening to my favorite albums and then also seeing how poetry collections were organized yeah. and some of the strategies for movement within a poetry collection. And it's also interesting that you mentioned about like um, different, like I think of them as like narrative formats because yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, how do I put it? Like uh, a lot of times uh, folks who have been writing for a while, like really enjoy putting techniques and formats into binaries in the sense mm. of, like, you know, it's a short story versus the novel. And yes. then there's no novella, and then there's like prose versus poetry, and then there's like show versus tell, and like all that kind of stuff, which yes. really the trick of it is, is most of it, you just have to be, you should be knowledgeable of it all and just yeah. like pursue what interests you. And like for me personally, I really, I really like the format of the collected uh, story collection. Yeah. I am, I'm working on another one right now. I probably will try a novel next and then maybe someday I'll do like a mixed story collection. But I just, there's, um, you know, it's almost like, and it, it's almost like an odd choice because it's almost like if somebody got really excited about writing novellas, which I don't know anything yeah. about novellas. And I feel like even writing like a 30 page story like seems really daunting to me. So like, yeah. I would love to know more about novellas or 30 page stories, but I, I feel like talking about like, oh, I really want to master the form of story, link story collection, someone that's the same, I would get the same reaction as if I was like, I'm a serial novellaist, you know? <laughs> but I mean, it's it's all about the sort of the cumulative effect. Um, yeah. I was reading, I, read, I just read The Tradition by Jericho Brown. And oh my gosh, was, that's an amazing collection. Oh, it. I mean, it was, it was like I read. I read half of it in the first sitting, which doesn't normally happen. I mean, yeah. it was just and like it was great because even like the effect of the last sentence, where it has um, or not well, the last sentence in the last poem, where it has that series of poems, the duplex poems, yeah. and they have a specific form. Um, I I was worried when I picked up the book again that like maybe some of the effect that I had from picking it up would be lost because I spent yeah. too much time away. But that last poem still was, it was, I mean, it was just a crusher. And yeah. so I i think that like in a traditional novel, um, that's the main thing you're looking for is that accumulation of details that creates an accumulative psychological or emotional effect. I feel like if, I feel one like one thing I like about a collect, connected story collection is that you can do the same thing, but possibly more efficiently, and maybe with um, a little bit more of an element of surprise. But that's also just what I tell myself, so I'll keep on. <laughs> no, that makes so much sense to me. And actually, um, my one of my students, Hannah, uh, is uh, has a question about link story collections, where she's asking, "Can we explain the concept of a link story collection a little bit?" So, you know, how would you? define a link story collection, you know, to maybe those who aren't as familiar with that, that format or approach? I would say like, um, maybe traditionally, and, you know, maybe like, if we're looking at it from a publishing perspective, too, like there's, um, like a, let's say a general short story collection will just be kind of the collection of a, of a writer's current short stories. Um, and really to be honest about it like sometimes it could be either the thing that precedes a novel as like kind of the thing that introduces the author and gives the readers a taste of what they're doing or it's something that is it's kind of like some like it intercedes so yeah. the kind of almost the idea is that the short story collection it's not what the author is necessarily known for these are just some ideas and here you know of course there can be plenty of good short stories in there but really it's kind of like the, um, the appetizer before reading the novel or whatever is considered to be the bigger project. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like maybe over time that the short story is, I mean, you know, every once in a while there'd be an article like, is the novel dead? I, I feel like if we were to compare, like is the novel dead, is the short story dead, is the poetry collection dead? 
you see a lot more is a short story yeah. <laughs> than we do about the novel. And so yeah. the effect is, is that like functionally, I think that um, most short story collections, they might be all over the place, like technically and thematically. Um, and even like, I mean, it's, you know, cause I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. Let's say if you have a short story collection that's like 12 or 15 stories, um, usually about four of those stories are real like knockout stories, just like um, the craftsmanship is just really full and complete. And they also feel like they could only exist as a short story. And then like, right. after that, you have maybe four or five stories that are pretty good. Um, but it's like, by the time you get to the end, you still might have some interesting stories, but it doesn't feel cohesive. Right. Um, you get like kind of a sense of these are the themes that the author explores. Here are generally the styles that they use. Um, usually there might be a story or two that's clearly more experimental than the rest, um, but there's nothing that necessarily ties it all together. So that is like your general short story collection, which I think that there are also other ways. I mean, I'm sure that there's a short story collection that is has variation in tone and style and, and everything that is still um, where everything's really excellent and in a way it's still cohesive. Um, right. But those are the kind of general thoughts. Whereas yeah. a linked story collection um, is more overtly and thematically linked or I mean, you know, of course, cause it's linked, but so in a link collection, usually you'll have maybe reoccurring characters. So and it'll have reoccurring perspectives. Um, you might have everything occur in the same setting. Uh, usually in a link collection, you have um, characters that, um, characters exist in the same town. So like uh, a good connected short story collection would be like uh, Olive Kitteridge. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about that book and, and her other collections too, like um, uh, Anything is Possible, which is, kind of even borrows from the world of Olive Kitteridge too. Yeah. And then like a visit from the uh, Goon Squad. Yes, yeah. And maybe even Lives of Girls and Women by Alice Munro, which is kind of similar to your book in that it felt, it has the same narrator every story and it's, it's kind of a coming of age, but every story, either she's center stage or she kind of backs off and it's another character, kind of like how your, your stories will, Sometimes the narrator backs off and we have a really, you know, another character steps in like teeth, mm -hmm. um, that whole section, which was, oh, I loved that section of the book. Yeah. Hannah, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, that's, I love, I love talking about link collections and it's so funny about what you said about the, like the short story is always the one that's dying the most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's interesting, like, going to writing conferences, and I'm sure you've heard this, it's like, oh, story collections can't sell. Publishers only want a novel. Agents don't want to hear from you if you have a story collection. Um, I'm, you know, but it makes me sad. It's almost like, well, you, you have to have a novel with the mainstream publisher before the publisher will publish your short story collection. Well, I mean, I mean, that's kind of like in the vein of like, like something being true and untrue. I yeah. Think the pressure to produce a novel is more of a disadvantage to most writers, especially beginning writers, because yes. really all you can do is write your best stuff. Yes. And like to, there has to be like a level of challenge and also a level of comfort. And you just have to also be excited about it. So yes. if you're naturally a novelist and writing novels makes you excited, then that's what you should be doing. But if you're excited to write nonfiction the most or poetry or novellas or uh, graphic narratives, that's what you should be doing. Because yes. I, I feel like the effect is ultimately, you know, somebody could be trying to figure out their way. And then someone comes and says like, you need a novel to be successful. And then they yes. just get overwhelmed. It, I mean, it's almost, yes. it's like if you were a painter and like you really like uh, expressionism and that's your big thing and you wanna get better at expressionism. And then someone says like, no, realism is the best or cubism is the best. Like no one will do anything with this expressionism. It, yeah. it kind of defeats the purpose of you trying to make your art. 
Um, oh, yes, because it's so frustrating sitting sometimes in those conferences with, you know, on these publishing panels and you can just feel everyone around you spirits just like slowly shriveling up and dying. Uh, I mean, to me, this is the beauty of small press publishing, too, because and I love I mean, you published with the Southeast Missouri State University Press for this book. And, you know, I was reading over all the awards that this book has won. It's won, of course, the Nielsen Prize, a 2019 Forward Indies Gold Award, um, a nomination for the Penn, Penn Prize, um, and a 2020 Hurston Wright Legacy Award nomination. I mean, that's amazing. And I, as a person who owns a small bookstore, I can now say, you know, with some authority, <laughs> that I love working with small presses. Mm -hmm. They have so much passion for their authors. And, you know, there's just this kind of energy and enthusiasm about the authors where it's a person and, and it's the idea and it's the subject. It's not a product, mm -hmm. you know, not to say that mainstream publishing is jaded like that, but I do on the other end now seeing it a little bit and even meeting authors at book conferences and stuff it's really interesting to see how the small presses are just markedly different in that regard i i feel like i couldn't have wished for a better publishing experience yeah so the story i always tell is that whenever i had finished the book and i had sent it out i sent it out and i was just like i was kind of expecting you know like to wait two or three years to see what happens and um after I'd sent it out, I talked to friends who had first books coming out and I asked them about their experiences. And uh, most of them weren't that happy <laughs> with their yeah. experience. So I got really anxious because I was just like, oh man, like, you know, like what if I managed to like work with this really great or prestigious publisher, um, but we just don't get along for whatever reason. Yeah. And so I was really relieved when I started working with James Brewbreaker at CMO Press um, because it was just great, like the processes, the um, professionalism, the friendship, everything was there. And as awesome. a person, I am, I'm pretty, I'm pretty pragmatic as far as how I approach writing and a writing life and a writing career. And I was like, okay, like this, you know, I mean, I have sort of a plan and like a process and I was like, okay, this is the first book. Um, you know, this is in big part a learning process. And I was just like, I hope it goes well and I hope I learn something. And that's exactly what happened. And um, I think what's maybe more important than just like finishing a book and then putting it out somewhere is also the relationships you build. Yeah, I, feel I like that. I had the opportunity to build really great relationships. And it's also nice to have the idea that this is maybe the start, like as more people read the book or see more work out there, um, there will just be more conversations, which is all that I can hope for as a writer. Absolutely. And um, I want to turn to a question from my graduate student, John, um, who says, one thing that really strikes me about the section you read from your new story is the casual introduction of plagues for sale. Um, would you say there's a magical realist element in this story? And if so, did you begin the story with this concept in mind? And he says, thank you so much for an awesome reading. Yeah, um, so magical realism is the is overtly the literary tradition that I'm pursuing in my new project. And so like kind of going off that idea of being very pragmatic in what I do as far as writing projects and also the idea that like um, I knew you know, people ask like, how do you know a project is done? For me, it's kind of like if if it reaches the limit of the ideas that it can contain. Um, mm -hmm. So with Avery Colt as a snake, a thief, a liar, this is my best uh, attempt at sort of like straightforward American realism. Um, a lot of postmodernism got in there, um, like in a subtle way. Uh, but I would say that the story like, uh, like Teeth Story. I was gonna say Teeth Story, yeah. That's one that I wrote toward the end. Um, and some of the stories that have more of a speculative or magical or fantastical element um, tended to come toward the end. And at that point, I was like, well, okay, what's what direction do I wanna take my stories in? And so like um, the Avery Colt stories, they're very intentionally low concept stories as I was focusing on the interior of a character 
and then also the relationships and yeah. the personal viewpoint. With the current project that I'm working on now, I, I want to work with magical realism because I want to work with high concept stories mm. and see how I can build them up. Um, while also incorporating that knowledge and that the practice I got with building characters and um, interiors. And for the magical realism, so, well, I mean, to step back a little bit, probably most likely for each project, each new major project, I want to experiment with a new tradition or genre uh, overtly mm -hmm. as it's just fun. Like, it, yeah. like I really love the technical stuff about storytelling and writing. And so as I'm reading um, new manuals and new books and new work, I always read, you know, I'll read a poetry collection and I'll be like, like I'll notice the technique and I'm like, man, I want to do that. And yeah. so I think it, it always keeps uh, projects fresh and exciting for me. Um, the other side of the magical realist aspect is that um, with this current project, which is right now tentatively called Catacombs Incorporated, um, I grew up in North St. Louis where there is some economic blight. And when I go back home, I kind of see sections of my neighborhood disappear um, as more buildings become abandoned. And in doing the research, you realize that there's a lot of systemic corruption. And even just in the history of how St. Louis operates and how it operates with different sections of the city, it's very unsettling. And so going back home and seeing different sections of my neighborhood like disappear or this place that was once a house or a business, it's turned into a field. That feeling mm -hmm. itself is really surreal and like, you know, like grimly fantastic. Like how did a whole place just disappear? And yeah. so I started thinking in those kind of like absurdist and like magical terms. And so any of the magic that or like fantastical elements that I'm working with, they're pulled from that sensibility. So it's kind of like, it's instead of um, writing about this in the sense where I make something a metaphor um, or an extended metaphor or frame, I'm just making it, this is what this is. And um, so I'm working with the concept and I'm seeing how far I can push it and how I can make it important to a character and the setting and the world at large. I love that. I'm I'm curious as to like you know could would you point to specific books or writers that are really influential to you as magical realism? I mean, I'm thinking of as you were talking about going home and seeing this thing that's happening that feels almost surreal or magical or you know it feels like something metaphorical in itself um, reminds me of when Carmen Maria Machado talks about her book, um, Her Body and Other Parties, where she's, you know, she talks about magical realism is just the most authentic way of expressing how it feels to her to be a queer woman in the world, you know? And she's like, to me, this is the most authentic representation I can even give of what it feels like to be in this body. Mm -hmm. um, I think her writing is so amazing. I'm, I'm curious who, you know, who your influences are in that regard. Um, Tony, Tony Morrison, uh, yeah. Mitri, uh, Mo Yan, and uh, uh, Marquez, um, Borges, Borges is big, and uh, so specifically, like, going along with um, that quote from Carmen Maria Machado, it, it is kind of an, like, it's sometimes, sometimes you feel like the experiences that you have versus, like, what's considered mainstream or what people would want you to believe are just so absurd right. that they can only yeah. be fantastical. It's just like, you know, yeah. it's like, does anybody else notice what's going on? And even if you try to explain it to somebody, like if you try to explain it in like realist terms or right. just like what happened, they're just like, oh, that's, that's unbelievable. And so it's right. like, it almost leads you to be like, okay, let me make this as physically absurd as possible so it'll get your attention and then maybe right. somewhere where you're kind of you pull somebody into the strangeness um they can get kind of a kind of a queer sense of that feeling themselves where they feel like while they might find it interesting or even enjoyable in parts part of like the message like seeps through and then they're just right. like oh you know like is this pointing to some kind of literal strangeness Right. Yeah. And 
I mean, if you think about sort of the origins of magical realism, even with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, it's all, you know, so much of it is pol is politically based. I mean, it's it's a critique and it's a, a way of seeing the world to kind of, yeah, like tweak the way you experience it so that someone can access that feeling Whereas maybe in another way, they can't access what that experience feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, that's, I just love magical realism. I think it's so, I love reading it. It's so hard to write it <laughs> because I think it's, it's challenging and it, it does have to kind of find you. I think that's, that's one thing I've noticed about trying to write magical realism is that any, it almost is like you find it or you stumble upon it mm -hmm. and it's, um, which is, really a neat experience when that happens it's um and like i part of it might be me being like um maybe like pretty particular and like over the years i've learned to be more like particular as i'm like building a story um but going from the shift of like writing realism to being able to say like okay this this fantastic stuff can happen it i mean it took me like a good three months and like even just stuff like changing from first person to third person it took yeah. me like a few months to like get into that mode to where I was like comfortable with what I was producing because it's not I mean it's like I know how to shift um, point of view and write in different points of view but it's like you get so ingrained in a particular way and it's like you get ingrained with like um it's almost like the the rhythm of thinking a certain way that like if you're thinking in first person like for specific characters you have certain rules for them and they think in a certain right. way they talk in a certain way and they observe in a certain way and then like right. if you go to third person that's coming through another character then it's like it's completely different and then it's yeah. like how do you how are you still yourself as an author but you hit those different rhythms and so yeah. like it's it's weird because like I think sometimes and it's probably true like there's stuff that when I write it probably other people don't really notice it but I notice how different it feels mm. um, but um and but that also that feeling of difference applies to different genres or traditions and right. that's really kind of where the fun of the of writing gets in where you start having more fun with writing but yeah. you know because traditionally like everyone would say like uh like realism for sure is like at the top of the heat and then like maybe postmodernism. um but like a lot of other traditions are pushed to the side and especially genre but it's just like it's just all different techniques you know that's yeah. almost like the guitar is the king of instruments and like, oh, you just play the flute. It's like, well, you could be really good at the flute. Like, <laughs> how are you gonna make a band? You gotta have different instruments. I love that. That's something I really admire about Colson Whitehead. I feel like he writes all these different kinds of books and all these different genres and approaches. I mean, you have like the magical realism of the Underground Railroad, and then you have the realism in the Nickel Boys, and then you know, you have like kind of the the twist on the zombie novel or the apocalyptic novel in zone one with this like really interesting approach. I, I, he is so versatile in his writing and I just, I admire that so much. I, I'm curious when you think about like the ways that you kind of play with these different genres, are, are those like purposeful decisions where you think, okay, I've, I'm kind of, now I'm really interested in this. Is it inspired by reading that you do? um isn't inspired by you know just like you mentioned that you read a lot of craft books and that in inspires you also it's um a lot it's a lot of that and it's also mainly the goals of the current project it's almost oh. like um yeah. trying to figure out the toolkit for that particular because yeah. it's sort of like if um i mean i'm not i'm not a super handy person but if you're gonna build something with wood you probably need like a, a saw and a you know hammer and some nails so that's what you're going to go out and get if you're going to build right. if you're going to build a shed so you're going to get those items but let's say that you're going to rebuild an engine and you know you want the engine to do particular things you're going to need a wrench you're going to need some motor oil so like it's still it's still you it's still your hands yeah. it's still what you know how to do it's still those basic motions but you're drawing upon just different tools and you have different materials and right. then like that, that also kind of takes some of the pressure off in a way um because it's like i mean it gets to the point where, like you know you could only get so good with this one particular technique but if you take this one technique and you drop it into a different set of rules it becomes completely different yeah that's also to say that like um 
you know, that just kind of depends on what kind of writer you are and what your goals are, because if you really love surrealism and that is just your thing and you're always going to be a surrealist writer, that's excellent. Or if it's realism, great. But I think there's probably, I mean, maybe it's 50 50, but I think there are probably more writers who like to work with different genres and different traditions and even formats than there yeah. are necessarily folks who are just like strictly just this one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that I really am so curious. Like whenever I get into a writer, I tend to try to read everything that they've written and it's, <laughs> it's interesting to explore that. I mean, and you talked about how, you know, you view each book that you finish or each project that you finish as a learning experience. I'm curious, like, what do you think was your main takeaway of writing, um, Avery Colt? Like, could you point to, a particular like recognition or insight that you had finishing this book that maybe you'll carry into your next project? Oh, great. I've been, I've been asking for like waiting for someone to ask me that question. Oh, uh, I'm so glad. Um, I would say that whenever I was writing Avery Cole, that's when I was finding my purpose as a writer. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of weird because it's sort of like things going in cycles. Like you start at one place and then you revolve away from it and then you come back to it. So I think that when I first started writing, when I was about 15 or 16, I was probably really interested in the kinds of stories that you find in Avery Cole. Um, but then as I was writing and practicing, like I, I was writing more like high concept stuff or more interested in more high concept stuff. And then when I started graduate school for the first couple of years, I was trying a little bit of everything as far as trying to figure out like literary traditions um, and mainly realism. So I got really excited about realism and I saw the potential there. So I was like, I wanna see like if all the techniques I learned over these couple of years can come together. And then as I was working to put those techniques I learned together, I also got more of a sense of what I wanted to write about, which I wanted to write about relationships. I wanted to write about, um, the complexity of relationships, like what what is a family, what is love, um, how are the different ways this is expressed, like uh, what what are the different ways that you can exist in a community, and how do communities grow, how do they mm -hmm. change, um, how do they handle challenges, um, and for me to be able to move forward and do more work with characterization and setting, I needed sort of a, sort of like a home base. I needed to know like what kind of characters I like to write. Um, I needed to have a better understanding of how my characters think and just like what kind of world that I enjoy building and what are the possibilities there. And so that, I mean, that's all to say, I learned a lot from writing this book. Um, yeah. I feel like it was the first time where I committed to a full project, which, um, you know, like, I mean, everybody, you know, has like unfinished manuscripts and stories and stuff like that. Um, and this was the first time in a long time, whereas like, I think this whole thing can come together and it can become something that's meaningful and lasting, not just mm. for readers, but also for me as a manual to yeah. kind of come back to. Oh, I love that. That's so inspiring. I mean, and and that idea of, yeah, like sh the learning is, is exploring these, like you said, your purpose as a writer, which is, you know, kind of this interior emotional work of discovering relationships. And then also on like a practical level as an artist, like just saying, okay, I know now I can, I completed this and, you know, this is what it feels like to do that. And also to sit comfortably with things that aren't finished, knowing maybe you could feel more comfortable with them now knowing, okay, well, maybe it's sitting unfinished for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I, that's really comforting for me personally to hear. So <laughs> thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I, do we have any questions on Facebook? I know that a few people were talking about um, on, on the comments about like relating to the idea of stories as music and thinking about the idea of like musicality and storytelling. And then um, my student Sophie said that she got to work with you at River Sticks and she was really excited to tune in. Um, <laughs> did I hit the highlights? 
I'm trying to think. <laughs> he took the phone away, so I can't see it now. Um, this has been such a gift, Ron. That was like the fastest hour on the planet. I can't believe it's already eight o'clock. Uh, and we didn't even get to talk about comics or anything. Maybe we need to have a part two. Oh yeah, if there are any other questions, I did like, um, so I did like uh, have, uh, so I have a comic on the website um, for one of the stories. And then I also like for recent stories, I've been making like weird, like, uh, like flyers and like oh offices. could like you talk offices. a little bit about that i'm so curious about that well so like um i i, I did a little bit of it with avery Culp, um and, and i think i did it like instinctively at points where it like felt right um yeah there's but, like a lot of notes in in the mm -hmm. book sorry no one wanted to see my face up that close but yeah <laughs> <laughs> I like, um, I kind of like that feeling of like, let's say you're really deep into, uh, let's say a TV show or like a book or any kind of like imagined experience at which the point it kind of like, it kind of warps your sense of reality. Like when yeah. you stop reading it or you stop viewing it, you feel like you're tearing away from something. Mm -hmm. And so like in playing with the text and including other texts, like the feeling that I wanted to inspire is that like, if somebody's really deep into the prose or the language, then when they see this like object that could have come from the physical world, like embedded there, yeah. that it like capitalizes on that strangeness. Like if, yes. if you like, is this like a real thing? Like, did this come from somewhere? And so like um, with the current project, I'm kind of like, I'm doing it more intentionally because since I'm writing about this like corporation that is causing a lot of upheaval in the community I, and also because I had some marketing jobs and I feel like I need to get something out of the experience of having this job. <laughs> I love so it. I want to take like business communications and like subvert it uh, yeah. for my various purposes. And yeah. so I'm trying to find a way to like incorporate those graphics for a sense of like hyper realism. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it's fun and strange. <laughs> I love that. Well, it reminds me of, you know, in comics that comics do that so often, like in po postmodernism, Chris Ware has you like in Jimmy Corgan, the smartest kid on earth, like they buy a house and then the next page is like a cutout and you can make the house, you know, which is of course like a throwback to the old comics where you would do that. Like you would, that would be part of your experience with the comic, but now he's like subverting it, which is so I love that. It's so interesting, especially in like a magical realist setting. I feel like that would be especially fun. Have you, I, I was thinking of three story secret history of a giant man by Matt Kent, who's also in St. Louis. And he has this really interesting comic that's magical realism where like part of it is he, this, the main character goes to be three stories tall mm -hmm. and like the government kind of starts using him and he starts making money on these ads. And every once in a while you get to an ad but then you read the ad copy and it's just, a, it's like a conversation between two characters. Oh, nice. But it, it's so interesting. I just, I love when writers get playful and fun. Like you said, mm -hmm. it's just fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, do you feel like that sense of play is something you've recently discovered or have you always had that in your work? Uh, I, I think that's something I've always needed because like what's really, so I think everyone, has to have you have to be able to balance a sense of internal satisfaction and gratification with also that you need to work at a level which you get some external validation mm -hmm. um, where you are connecting with the reader and so like because that external validation is, isn't always going to be there but your internal gratification it can always be there so like um you know sometimes like uh you know something like let's say if i get a story accepted for publication like that feels really good and that's great. And it's um, it's a time for celebration and everything. Yeah. But what I always think about is like, if it's 2 a.m. and I've been like chewing on a story for two weeks and I finally get down that one paragraph in the middle mm -hmm. that I've been trying to get down and then like I read it and I'm just like, sometimes it's like fun. Like who wrote this? This is, <laughs> this is wild. Like who thought that they could do this? Like those are the moments that I always want to hold on to. Um, yeah. because that's what keeps you going really um yeah it's um kind of keeps you like motivated to like just try new things and like I, I think playfulness and fun and art 
is there has to be some level of joy. And especially, I think that it's important to write about political and social issues. And it can be intense, it can be draining, it can be scary. Um, it can be something that like, uh, you know, can even like alter your mood sometimes. So there needs to be that like that contrast between mm. like I'm doing this difficult work that's important, but also I can step back for a minute and find a way to make it in, engaging for both me and the reader. Yeah. Well, and like you said, like using using the skill set in from like the corporate world into this fictional world and letting your creativity kind of span, you know that whole range must be really cool. Can you hold that up one more time? It's, it's like a catalog. So this is, um, so I'm writing a story about the corporation and they're like, they're doing a big uh, hiring. Um, oh, wow. And so they're, they're hiring a lot of people. And then uh, this is about like, um, I'm still like messing with it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, they have like a, uh, like a people management technology where you have to sign a contract and it, you know, it holds your soul ransom. And so I wow. found this flyer <laughs> that kind of like represents corporate America to me. And then I took it and like, I messed with the text so that it talks about all these different, uh, you know, kind of like predatory technologies. And so like, wow. you know, kind of the uh, mischievous part of me is like someday, like if I were to leave this somewhere, somebody would like pick it up and be like, what? I was already thinking like, I want to put that up in, in my bookshop and now people would be like, what is this? And then I can say, go read that book. <laughs> you, um, have you uh, seen any of the obvious plant toys? No. Oh, they're great. So it's just like- I'm you, writing that down. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. So like, uh, let me see. So it's, a, it's an artist and he makes toys that are just like these strange toys and they'll put them in uh, like, like Walmart and things like that. So you could <clears throat> you could conceivably go to a Walmart and find like a like a pre-cracked egg <laughs> and it has a logo on there but it's um so I think I was influenced and inspired by a bit of that too. I love that. That's so experimental and it's very yeah, it's like very interactive and playful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is so cool. Well, okay, and that was like such an easy extra 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> I know, I think we do need a part two. Um, Ron, everyone on Facebook is thanking you for all of your insight and your generosity and sharing about your work. I cannot thank you enough for giving your time this evening and just answering all my questions and talking so generously and sharing your new story, which I love to hear. I can't wait for this new project. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that I like that you would love to talk about that I didn't ask or didn't think to ask? No, this was a great time. I really appreciate oh, wonderful. Um, your attention. I appreciate that you like, I'm just happy that you enjoyed the book and you had like really great questions and uh, Loved yeah, it. This, this was fun. <laughs> this is great. Well, in my mind, I'm, I'm envisioning part two is you just coming down to the shop and <laughs> having a great you know, visit and like maybe the world will be at least where we can gather in person together would be just wonderful. So as soon as that's available, I'll be calling you to schedule something. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. I so appreciate it. Please be well and good luck with the fall semester at Wash U. That's so exciting. And I'm glad to know you'll be safe doing that. Um, yeah. And uh, you as well. I hope everything is good in your neck of the woods and thank um you. You know, thank you for your time too and uh whenever if you know whoever is writing you know earth 2020 whenever they get their stuff together <laughs> and yes. that, we'll uh we'll get together <laughs> i can't wait thank you so much ron and thank you to, yeah to everybody who tuned in thank you so much and yeah you can um purchase ron's book from our shop if you're here in town you can come pick it up or you can always order it or order it online and then maybe when he comes to visit you can get it signed <laughs> yes All right. awesome well i will be in touch thank you so much have a good night you too